to record on the computer and we are, okay, we are recording. I am obfuscated from view and three, two, one. Good afternoon. My name is Commander Lance Denham. I'm the executive officer for Naval Base Kitsap in Bremerton. It's located on the western side of Seattle, about five hours from Spokane. I uh, want to say thank you very much for letting me be here today. I'm very excited about a couple of topics that I wanted to discuss with you. A couple of things, a little bit of history about me. I grew up in Spokane. I went to University High School and I graduated in 1993. I joined the Navy from there as a missile technician and went quickly off to boot camp and through some training courses eventually found myself on my first submarine back out here in Bremerton, Washington, aboard the USS Nevada, where I served as a missile technician for about two and a half years before I got selected to a officer commissioning program. They sent me to school out in Rhode Island and then made my way back to the University of Washington, where I graduated with a metallurgical engineering degree in 2002 and subsequently spent the remainder of my career working majorly on submarines. So I wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you about a little bit about the submarine lifestyle, what it is the submarine community is about, uh, some of the great, wonderful experiences that you can have in the submarine force. Uh, be before I get there, some of the other jobs that I have done in the Navy, I've actually had an opportunity to work on board aircraft carriers. I have served on almost every class of submarine the Navy has to offer. And now I'm, like I said, the executive officer for Naval Base Kitsap out here in Bremerton, Washington. That's very similar to being the, the vice principal of the school. And so my job out here is to make sure that the, we have about, I would say 75 tenant commands, which we can classify those as teachers. So I have about 75 teachers that are in charge of their own classrooms and they're in charge of their own students. So Naval Base Kitsap is the third largest naval installation in the United States. We comprise of about 13,000 acres, about 40,000 military and civilian personnel that work or live on board the base. And we are by far the most complex installation that there is in the United States. We have every single mission set that the submarines or not, not submarines, but that the Navy has to offer with the exception of a, um, a flight path. So we don't have jets, we don't have aircraft taking off, off, off here, but we have surface ships, we have submarines, we have helicopter pads, we've got a lot of um, uh, support facilities here, the morale, welfare, and recreation, but we also have the, the West Coast's largest dry dock, largest shipyard that we have multiple aircraft carriers and submarines coming through to get retrofitted to make them ready to go out on their next deployment and be ready for another five six years of continual operation so that's that's kind of what we do here at naval base kitsap and my main focus my main job as the executive officer is to ensure that all those 74 75 teachers, tenant commands that are on the base that are trying to execute their own mission, I'm here to make sure that they have everything they need in order to do that. And that could come down to uh, airspace for the helicopters, making sure that I have the port clear to have the submarine or the aircraft carrier arrive home, or it could just come down solely to having people go down to their ship to make sure that they have personnel ready to go into their barracks rooms or that they understand what the base has to offer for recreation or things that we can do for their family. It's a very busy job. It's very dynamic, but it's also a lot of fun. So that's, that's a little bit of a nutshell with what I do in the Navy now. What I didn't tell you is that I joined the Navy in 1993, so I may have actually gone to high school and graduated with some of your parents. So hopefully, hopefully there's somebody in the uh, audience that, uh, whose parents know, know me, the University of High School, 1993. So uh, one of the things that I think is important about the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, program is what it is you all will be able to get involved with specifically in the Navy if you take that route. There are so many wonderful opportunities 
throughout the entire gambit of the United States Navy in every single community. But since I'm more focused on the submarine portion of it, that's where I wanted to make sure I had an opportunity to talk to you and let you know where it is that your background and everything that you've been working so hard to do can actually benefit the Navy and subsequently benefit you and your family in the future. So we have a lot of different types of technology in the Navy and specifically on submarines, the um, submarine is a very fantastic piece of machinery. It's probably one of the most technologically advanced. And I don't say that because I'm part of the community, but where is it where you're going to be able to take 150 or up to 200 men and women, put them into a sardine can, if you want to put it that way, close the lid, and then take them underwater, take them down to four, five, six, seven hundred 700 feet, where the water pressure is 100 pounds per square inch or 44 pounds per square inch every 100 feet. So if you can imagine the amount of pressure that it takes for your parents to take that pressure washer and clean off the grime and muck on your driveway, that's coming out you know, pretty hard. Imagine just having that on every single square inch of a submarine. And that's, that's kind of where I wanted to go. And I, so there's two, there's two different classes of submarines. You've got a fast attack submarine and you've got the boomer class submarine, the SSBNs, uh, sort of SSGNs. And they have, both have different types of missions, different types of jobs. So first and foremost, the SSN. Uh, the SSN stands for Submersible Submarine Nuclear. All of our submarines in the United States Navy are operated by a nuclear power plant. Okay, so we, the SSNs are typically about 360 feet long, maybe a little shorter, maybe a little bit longer, depending on the classes. And they have a range of different responsibilities. They will go out and do what's called intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. They will go out with surface ships to protect them and make sure that they can get to wherever they need to get to in the world. They've got anti-submarine warfare, anti-surface warfare, a lot of different things. It takes a lot of technology in order to be able to do those various mission sets. And on board the submarine, in order to just operate it on a day-to-day -day basis, we're underwater. There's, I'm certain some of you have seen 20,000 leagues under the sea, but uh, we don't really have windows on board a submarine because of that water pressure when we're so deep. So how do we see? Well, we see by what's called sonar. Sonar is sound navigation and ranging. It takes the amount of time a sound wave comes from another object and gets to the boat and how long it's traveling over the course of a, a set of degrees. We call that target motion analysis. So we get a lot of engineering, we got a lot of uh, geography or geometry in there. So that's how we see underwater. That's how we can make sure that we know that we're not gonna run into something that's moving. We also have underwater maps. My, uh, my assistant navigator would probably be upset that I said that, but they're called charts, but they're really underwater maps. Take the GPS in your car and it'll tell you if you're trying to turn right to drive into a building, well, you need to turn right, you missed your turn. That's kind of what we have for the submarine when we're operating underwater. But then we come up to the surface and we want to be able to see at periscope depth, keep the majority of the submarine underwater and we want to be able to see what's going on around us. Well, then we have our periscopes. That's a set of mirrors and cameras and lenses in order for us to be able to see what's going on outside. Not very high tech in terms of how we we're able to see from the submarine out into the water, but our ability to record some of the things that we see and get that information and feed that back down to some of the important people on the submarine so they can make decisions based off of what they are seeing. Then we've got communications. How do, how do we communicate with our family and with our loved ones when we're underwater for two, three, four months at a time. Well, we don't have the typical email that you will have when you're at home. We certainly don't have cable television. We don't have the uh, ability to just log on the internet and Google something, but we do have the ability to send messages home. It's just a little bit slower, but they also wanna be able to get messages back to us. So the lot, there's a lot of technology getting messages from satellites down to us in a timely fashion. So we know what is going on back home. It's very important for us to know what's going on back, home, just like it's very important for them to know what's going on with us. Okay, and then the, the biggest, almost the most important portion of a submarine is making sure that we can just continue to operate underwater. 
And how do we do that? So we do that with a, a nuclear reactor. And I'll go into a nuclear reactor here in, in a couple minutes, but the um, just a couple small things. I'm gonna show you a picture and give you a little bit of a, an understanding on the size and the scale when it comes to various submarines and what we do. So, all right, just to make sure that we don't have enough glare. So as I told you before, we were talking about fast attack submarines, the submersible ship nuclear, the one up there at the top. That's about 390 feet long. Then you have the submarine below that. That's called an SSBN. That's a little bit longer. That's about 560 feet long. Okay, to put that into perspective, that's about as tall as the Space Needle. And if you haven't been out to Seattle to see the Space Needle, the Bank of America Banking Financial Center in downtown Spokane is 288 feet tall. So the next time you get an opportunity to go downtown Seattle, put two of those on top of each other. And that is how long that is if you were to take it and put it on end. Okay. And then we got just a couple numbers here just to kind of put it into perspective. Puts those numbers, uh, you know, the length and right here over on the uh, left or right hand side, I can't really figure it out, but that doesn't necessarily matter. And I put down there displacement. And as you see for the SSBN submarine, it's got about 18,000 tons of displacement. And then for the SSN, anywhere between uh, 59 to 60 or 7,900 tons of displacement. So what does that mean? What does displacement mean? That is the weight of the water that if you were to take that submarine and all that water and put it in onto a scale, that's how much that would weigh. So 18,700 tons, multiply that times two, that's, that's a lot of pounds. So that's a lot of machinery pushing around in the ocean. So it's kind of neat to operate on one of those and work with all the different machines that we have. Uh, and then, we, like I said before, we have the reactor, okay? So I've got a picture, this is a very rudimentary, Photograph. Some of you may know more about this, however, just to put it in perspective. So that little circle that says RX, well, that's the reactor. That, its whole job is to create really hot water. And it, they make that really hot water under pressure. The higher the pressure, the higher the temperature, you'll be able to take that water past the boiling point of 212 degrees without it vaporizing. So we do that under very, very high pressure conditions, very much like a, a a uh, crock pot that your, that your mom and dad or maybe your grandmother use. Uh, and then that hot water goes into what's called the steam generator. That steam generator takes that hot water and puts it in a whole bunch of these little small tubes. And then a bunch of cold water pours down on top of it and makes that steam that's coming out of the top of that steam generator. We take that steam and we send it and we split it. And it goes through two different sets of turbines, one to make electrical power, and one to make propulsion. So that propulsion then turns the screw and then the steam will then join back up with the steam from the electrical turbines, go into what we call condensers, which puts it in an even colder environment, takes that steam and then condenses it back to water. And then we start it all over again, back into the bottom of the reactor in order for it to get hot again. So we do this in order to make sure that the two systems, the primary water, which is the water that's in the reactor, and the water that's cooling the water from the reactor, stay separate. And that's very important because the water in the reactor, if you lose cooling, bad things happen. Some of you may have heard of Chernobyl or Fukushima. So the reactors that we have on these submarines are extremely safe. We have a, an extremely large amount of safeguards and extremely technically trained individuals, people like yourselves that join the Navy, they join these programs and they get to operate these types of uh, equipment on the submarine, either forward up there where you have the sonar system, the communication systems, the weapon systems, all the different types of uh, technology that we have on board a submarine in order to be able to stay away from home. Many people ask, what is the most limiting factor on board of a submarine in order for us to stay at sea for an extended period of time. And honestly, that's really food. We can make our own water. We can make, uh, we can do that consistently throughout the entire day. We have all, we have movies, we have television, we have communications, we have all of it, but we all run out of food at some point. So 
And that's the only thing that really prevents us from staying at sea indefinitely. Another couple of things I wanted to just bring up uh, is to let you know what, what it's like being on board a submarine. So you have 150 to 160 personnel from all different walks of life, and you all come together for the same mission, the same job to get underway, to go out and do what the Navy tells us we need to do. It could be for one week, it could be for five weeks, it could be for up to six months away from home. But it's it's an, a wonderfully small city. You get to know everybody's name. You get to know what they like. You get to know their families. You may not have met this sailor's wife or husband, but when you get home, you'll almost know everything you need to know about them to be able to walk up and have a conversation that you've, that even though you've never met them. And you'll make lifelong friends. I still keep in touch with some of my friends from when I went through boot camp. Uh, my first school after I got out of boot camp, my second school after I got out of boot camp, I have friends that live not too far, maybe about two hours that I have known for 28 years in the Navy and we still keep in touch. So the, the fact that you'll make some of the greatest lifelong friends in your life is a, a pretty amazing thing. You'll also get to see foreign countries. You'll get to go and see some wonderful places, do some wonderful things. I've had the opportunity on submarines to go to Scotland, Norway, France, England, Spain, Japan, <clears throat> all kinds of great and wonderful places and meet some wonderful people in each one of those port calls. Uh, another wonderful thing about being specifically on submarines is that when you're driving in the bridge at night, so the bridge, to put this, make sure you understand what I'm talking about. The bridge is that small thing on the top here, okay? Well, when we're on the surface and we're, and we're driving out, uh, you know, the ports are not necessarily deep enough for us to immediately submerge and go out. So we have to drive on the surface for sometimes a considerable amount of time. And you get a stand up, stand watch up there as the officer of the deck and experience a whole plethora of things that you wouldn't do just sitting in Spokane. And I remember driving off the coast of, it might've been Scotland or Norway, uh, could have been Hawaii. It's hard to remember it so many times, but the, uh, I think it was off the coast of Hawaii going out and it was 2.30 in the morning. There was another ship in sight. The only light in the sky were the moon and the stars. And behind the boat, the submarine, we call submarine a boat, Behind the boat, in the trail on the water, in the chop, you could see the phosphorescence churn up. So the water actually glowed, which was really cool. And then in the front of the boat, we had dolphins and they're jumping. Dolphins love to play with submarines. They always like to stay in front, stay in front of our bow as we're traveling through the ocean. And you'll see them jump out and turn and twist. So it's a really neat experience. And it's a lot of wonderful times up there. There's no other sound other than the waves chopping on the, on the, uh, on the sound of the hull. It's extremely peaceful. And then the, the friends up there that you get an opportunity to meet, you get to talk to everybody. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's, those are really some of the major things that I wanted to make sure to bring up is that uh, it, how important it is for what it is the STEM program can bring for your future, specifically in the Navy, and all the different wonderful things that the submarine community has to offer. Every single inch of that submarine has a technological advance that it may sound simple in its execution when they tell you what it does, but everything and how it went and what it is that makes it work is pretty astounding. So I welcome you to look forward to the uh, look Look to the Navy, look to the submarine force. And if uh, any of you have watched this video and make yourselves to the Navy, and by all means, look me up. I hope to have an opportunity to share the bridge one day with you and listen to the dolphins play off the bow. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. And don't hesitate to reach out if you ever have any questions. Take care.